So I'm excited to talk to you today about the scientific history of Palomar Observatory, told in more detail in my book, Cosmic Odyssey, How Intrepid Astronomers at Palomar Observatory Changed Our View of the Universe. The book will launch in bookstores next Tuesday, so this is my first opportunity to talk about it. My plan for today is to tell you about work done at Palomar, about myself, and about how I came to write this book, and to share some of my favorite stories and images. I'll take questions at the end of the talk. As dusk falls on Palomar Observatory, currently in its 83rd year of operation, astronomers with single-minded purpose are usually preparing their finds and programs inside the domes for a new adventure into space. Cosmic Odyssey tells the story of how astronomers have explored different facets of the universe, from stellar up to the discovery of quasars, from colliding galaxies to merging black holes, from the leftover rubble of the solar system's birth to exoplanets circling other stars. The questions are, what did Palomar contribute to our understanding of the universe? How did, how did discoveries happen and mature from early theory to accept the paradigm? How did astronomers open up new windows of the electromagnetic spectrum to unveil star birth, the nucleus of our galaxy, and gamma, gamma ray bursts in the distant universe? To answer these questions, I followed threads of discovery across many places, people, and over time. Palomar is one of the world's premier astronomical observatories. It is anchored into the granite on top of a 5,700 foot high mountain in California's Northern San Diego County. It was envisioned by astrophysicist and entrepreneur, George Ellery Hale, who in 1928 secured a generous grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to construct a complete observatory around the world's largest telescope with a 200 inch diameter mirror. At first, only one telescope was planned, but that was about to change unexpectedly. But first, let me tell you a bit about how I came to write this book. Like many astronomers, I fell early and hard for the stars. My passion for astronomy began at age nine when I roamed the exhibits of the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles which is a visual maze of objects and images and scientific delights. I was fascinated not only by the scientific concepts, but also by their representations, the models, the motions, and the large scale graphics. I hold a BA in mathematics and a PhD in astronomy from UC Berkeley. And I lived in Chile for part of my graduate studies, observing at three Southern California, uh, sorry, three Southern observatories. I moved to Washington DC as a Carnegie Fellow in astronomy and published my research in the Astrophysical Journal. I then happily shifted my focus to raising four daughters with my husband, who was also an astronomer. In 2000, I jumped back into the workforce at Carnegie Observatories in its external affairs office. A few years later, I took a position teaching science writing at Caltech. And this was my favorite job providing students with the tools to translate cutting edge science into scientific American level papers for a general audience. The urge to write a book about the process of doing science, which had been germinating for a few years, took root from this experience. While researching this book, I held visitor status at Caltech, which provided access to Palomar and to a large pool of resident and visiting scientists for discussions and several hundred hours of interviews. In fact, among the people I was fortunate enough to interview was Stephen Hawking, who inspired me with his strong commitment to sharing science with the public. Finally, as the Rockefeller Foundation had supported the building of Palomar Observatory, they came back to provide a grant to support my research and the writing of this book. Our view of the universe has changed dramatically over the past century. The telescopes of Palomar Observatory played a key role in this change. In 1937, even Einstein took an interest in the giant telescope because it promised to see far enough into the universe to test his theory of general relativity. During my research, I found that many threads of discovery traced back to work done at Palomar. And the discoveries were fundamental enough to help rewrite the textbooks of astronomy in the mid to late 20th century. 
Cosmic Odyssey covers from the early 1930s to the 1990s, when Palomar's 200-inch reflector was surpassed in size by new telescopes, but the book actually extends to the present. Since the foundations built in the early years underlie much of the recent progress in astrophysics. So why did I choose Palomar Observatory as the focal point of my book? Simply, Palomar had a nearly unparalleled decades long run as a generator of fundamental insights about our universe. In 2009, National Geographic Magazine ranked the Hale Telescope as one of the 12 most significant developments and astronomical telescopes in history. Cosmic Vision, their article celebrating the International Year of Astronomy, lauded the Hale Telescope for its cutting edge science over 60 years while making key discoveries about galaxies and quasars. In fact, three of George Ellery Hale's telescope, the 40 inch refractor at Yerkes, the 100 inch Hooker reflector on Mount Wilson and the 200 inch reflector, all three landed on that list of 12 telescopes. That's pretty amazing. So what's important is that Palomar was at the forefront of astrophysical research and it stayed there for decades. It allowed us to expand our understanding of the universe again and again. It stayed at the forefront requiring ingenuity and technical skill and the telescopes plus their instruments evolved as our understanding did. And because it was at the forefront, it drew a real cast of characters from all over the world. So it provides fascinating and sometimes amusing insights into how science is done in an ecosystem of thinkers. First, I'll tell you about a few of the profound shifts in our understanding enabled by Palomar. There's quite a list, as you can see. Just for example, here's the top 11. <clears throat> Palomar and its international community of observers discovered quasars, which are manifestations of supermassive black holes fed by swirling accretion disks and helped solve their riddle. They showed how stars evolve and how they die, some with a bang and others with a whimper. They locked down supernovae of type 1a as near perfect distance indicators, pursued cosmological parameters such as the cosmic distance scale the universe's mass and the curvature of space, pressing the limits of the known universe relentlessly outward. They transformed our view of galaxies from static island universes to objects evolving by interacting, colliding, and merging with each other. Produced the first models of how our Milky Way galaxy assembled. They discovered radioactive technetium in the atmospheres of giant stars, proving that stars produce most chemical elements and not the Big Bang. They discovered that various kinds of stars, for example, supernovae and old giant stars, eject their outer layers and pollute the universe with a smog laden with heavy elements that transforms into new stars, planets, and life. They discovered brown dwarfs, the missing link between stars and planets. Discovered comet Shoemaker-Levy before it crashed into Jupiter discovered large pieces of outer solar system rubble that forced Pluto's reclassification to dwarf planetary status. Palomar was also at the forefront of several revolutions in observational techniques, such as the shift from purely optical to radio, infrared, X-ray, and gamma ray wavelengths, and from photographic plates to photoelectric counters to CCDs and to adaptive optics. Palomar is probably best known for the 1963 discovery of quasars, but I'll tell you about supernovae first because they trace all the way along the entire lifetime of the observatory. <clears throat> you may remember that I mentioned other telescopes were added to the original Sol 200 inch. The reason was that Caltech astrophysicist Fritz Vicky and Mount Wilson astronomer Walter Botta wanted to learn more about supernovae, which are exploding stars. Supernovae are rare and unpredictable, and they occur at the rate of about one per century in a galaxy like our Milky Way. So finding them is a matter of sheer luck and of observing a few hundred galaxies every month to catch a few supernovae every year. In the 1930s, Zwicky searched for supernovae from the Caltech campus 
using a three and a half inch Roland sack camera, but without success. Lucky for him, news arrived that a brilliant, whiskey loving, one handed Estonian born optician named Bernhard Voldemar Schmidt had invented the perfect camera for such searches. It was much faster than conventional telescopes and produced wide angle images that were sharp and free of distortions out to the very edge of the field of view. Within a year, an 18 inch diameter version of the Schmidt camera was installed on Palomar Mountain. By 1941, Zwicky had discovered 18 supernovae. That is 50% more than had been recorded in the preceding 2000 years. These successes drove home the notion to everybody that if they wanted to know where are the most interesting objects in the sky for pointing the giant telescope still under construction, it might be wise to have a larger version of a Schmidt camera as a scout telescope that would go deeper and cover larger fields. A larger 48 inch version of the Schmidt camera was then constructed and dedicated in 1948. But for 12 years, the small Schmidt was Palomar's sole sentinel on the universe and Zwicky was its master. Mount Wilson astronomer Walter Botta would always refer to the camera as the Schmidt out of deep gratitude to his optician friend from the Hamburg Observatory. And I follow that convention in this book. Schmidt has, had invented something really marvelous. This little telescope photographed areas eight and a half degrees in diameter, which is about 17 times the apparent width of the moon. The 200 inch on the other hand would push much deeper into space, but it covered only about half a moon diameter. So in the first five months, Zwicky photographed 100 fields spanning one sixth of the entire sky visible from Palomar. He sketched a cornucopia of strange objects, wisps of luminous material that stretched like taffy around and between galaxies, streamers, and groups of distorted galaxies. His physics background signaled to him that the galaxy's stars and gas were being pulled out and expelled into space, representing gravitational tides. These tides were analogous to, but much stronger than, the ocean tides raised by the moon on opposite sides of the Earth. While Zwicky understood the gist of gravitational interactions well, most astronomers remained oblivious to the power of gravity on cosmic scales. It would take them nearly two decades to catch up with Zwicky. <clears throat> with the 18 inch Schmidt pushed nearly horizontal, in 1941, Zwicky discovered a galaxy that appeared as a ring of bright stars, although he knew that configuration had to be gravitationally unstable. That object, now known as the Cartwheel Galaxy, has been much studied and photographed with the Hubble Space Telescope. When Mount Wilson astronomer Edwin Hubble expressed doubts that Zwicky actually saw a major galaxy cluster in the constellation Pisces, Zwicky pointed out Hubble could not possibly have recognized it with the 100 inch hooker, since he would, not have, he would have seen only a tenth of the cluster. Zwicky could be quite pugnacious and was famous for calling people spherical bastards. That is, people who are bastards no matter how you look at them. For my book, I coined the term spherical genius, which describes Zwicky to a T. Okay, so let's return to the supernovae in thread, which over the years split into various paths to even more discoveries. In one path, the team of Mount Wilson and Palomar astronomers recognized that supernovae could be divided into four types, one through four, depending on their spectroscopic properties and their light curves. In 1968, from a single plot of type one supernovae, one supernova hunter named Charlie Kowal determined that they reached very similar maximum luminosities. And he even predicted that type one supernovae would one day become reliable standard candles for cosmological distance measurements. He sure had a keen eye, keen eye for the future. I was lucky to interview Charlie in, a 20, in 2010, and I love this quote from him. And the building he refers to is the Robinson Lab for Astrophysics, 
on the Caltech campus and his office was in the sub-basement along with Spickies. <clears throat> this building is like an ocean liner. All the professors are up there on the promenade deck promenading. And this is the engine room where all the work gets done. He didn't make many friends with that, unquote. The final honing of type one supernovae was done in the mid 1980s by Jay Elias, a shy, soft-spoken infrared astronomer. On a hunch, Elias observed the fading light of supernovae in the infrared with the 200 inch telescope. He found that their light faded in a fundamentally different way than it did in visible light. This allowed him to recognize that there are two kinds of type one supernovae, not just one, type 1a and type 1b. Type 1a supernovae became the razor sharp measuring tool that cosmologists needed to lock down the parameters describing the expected gradual slowing down of the universe's rate of expansion. A slowing down that would be due to the mutual gravitational force between objects in the universe. Two independent teams of astrophysicists then spent years observing supernovae, then calibrating and analyzing their data. But surprise, six decades after Fitzvicky had begun scanning the sky for supernovae, the contrarian universe yielded some shocking evidence. Sometime in the past five billion years, the expansion rate of our universe had switched from slowing down to speeding up. This is one of the most baffling discoveries of the 20th century. And for this discovery, the two Tim teams shared the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. Theoreticians soon introduced the concept of dark energy as a pervading repulsive force that pushes everything apart. The phenomenon is not still full un, uh, fully understood, and astronomers are now chasing dark energy. Okay, let's end that thread for now. Although, as you can imagine, it continues into the present. For millennia, we humans viewed the universe only in the narrow wavelength band of our lives. Then, with the end of World War II, New technology allowed engineers to expand the range of wavelengths available to study the sky. Fledgling radio astronomers discovered some puzzlingly bright sources of radio energy, sometimes buried within crowded fields of stars and galaxies. They asked Palomar astronomers to search for optical counterparts with the 48-inch Schmidt and the 200-inch telescope. By 1963, some optical counterparts of radio sources were found that looked like blue stars. However, spectra taken of these stars by Caltech astronomer Martin Schmidt show that their appearance was deceiving. In reality, these strange point-like sources of light lay billions of light years from Earth, and they disgorged enormous amounts of energy, equivalent to that of trillions of stars, all, from, all of that from a tiny, solar system size volume. Now they are called quasi-stellar radio sources or quasars. The source shown here, called 3C273, and first identified by Schmidt, has a one-sided wiggly jet at four o'clock that we now know comes straight out of a supermassive black hole. The beacon of blue light shining from the center of this disturbed looking galaxy is a telltale sign of a quasar. The highly luminous center of this galaxy is powered by a disk of accreting gas swirling around a supermassive black hole. Quasars of extreme luminosities act as powerful searchlights that allow astronomers to explore the far reaches of the universe. Quasar spectra have revealed that the universe is filled with gaseous filaments forming a cosmic web. Caltech astronomer Wal Sargent was one of the first to study these gaseous filaments with the 200-inch telescope in the 1970s. He's famous for his British humor, as shown in this anecdote. Late in the afternoon, Wal Sargent would survey the sky from the catwalk of the 200-inch telescope, looking at the sky to predict the weather for the night. Once, several tourists spotted him and asked, hey you, how'd you get up there? In his idiosyncratic way, Sergeant looked down at them and growled, with 30 years of bloody hard work. 
Palomar Observatory was a perfect vehicle for bringing into focus an interesting period of science history, a very crucial period touching on the marriage of physics and astronomy. The stories in Cosmic Odyssey unfold much as they did for the researchers with gaps, diversions, dead ends, leaps of insight, and suspense. Sometimes their threads dip back 10, 20, or even 50 years and across continents to other teams and telescopes, all to retrieve a relevant clue. The story's protagonists battled uncertainty and self-doubt, challenging technology and frigid cold. They were driven by their passion and often their ambition. Sometimes their progress in science was a result of luck or even caprice. They were an interesting lot to interview, but no matter what their motivations were, they laid bare a universe of grueling complexity, profound mystery, and infinite beauty that no one could have foretold. I had the pleasure of interviewing Martin Schmidt, who discovered quasars, as I just mentioned, and I asked him how he felt about making this important discovery. His answer was, Sometimes when I hear an artist explain their work, I find that I'm not enlightened because it is the art itself which speaks. And somehow I prefer not to try and explain what I felt about my own work because I'm not sure that I really know. I feel that whatever happened speaks for itself. After around 60 years of research, I don't ask anymore why I'm motivated. It's always the same. I know there's a universe and I have to investigate it. Before I wrap up and take your questions, let me take a few minutes and tell you what it was actually like to be at Palomar, to bring you into the dome. And I'll quote from my book for this. <clears throat> Imagine observing at Palomar, the wearing of the telescope and the rumble of the dome moving in the darkness the oily smells, the we're there of the telescope operator, looking up at the starry sky from the catwalk and watching the marine layer creep up the mountain and stop just below the domes as if to insulate you on astronomy island. This is the belle epoque of cosmic exploration and we're all participants. During many stays at Palomar's monastery, I had the privilege of joining astronomers and technicians at work in the 200 inch data room, chasing and recording objects ranging from ragtag newborn galaxies to exoplanets. During engineering breaks, I crawled inside the cramped oil drenched arms of the Big Eye's massive horseshoe, where early infrared astronomers had long ago installed their cooling apparatus and detectors. And I peeked out from the prime focus cage perched near the apex of the 135 foot dome. I swept my hand over the smooth circular rails that carry the thousand ton dome as it rotates in lockstep with the sky's diurnal motion. I donned Tyvek gear to help the crew clean the mirror, then ogled in wonderment as a new coat of vaporized aluminous, aluminum drifted onto its surface. I touched workhorse gears forged nearly 90 years ago and admired the exquisite choreography of skilled mountain personnel maneuvering backhoes inside the dome as they swapped out delicate car-sized instruments. Such extraordinary moments kept me inspired while toiling over these stories. They also reminded me that the scientific method is only part of discovery, just as it is only part of this book. Human cleverness, courage, and sometimes foibles are equally essential and just as fascinating. Now I'd like to take some of your questions. If you would uh, type them into the chat and I'll pass them on to Dr. Schweitzer. There are any questions. We have a very shy crew today. <laughs> Maybe I told them everything they needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's 
Elizabeth Merrill asks, what was the most interesting interview you conducted of, of the many interviews you conducted? Well, which one was the most interesting? That's a hard choice. I think one of the, one of the first interviews was Martin Schmidt. And I was impressed that he really got into the time mm -hmm. during which I was interviewing him for. So he went back um, 30 years or so. Um, and when he was describing meetings with Jim Gunn and they were trying to design a new instrument, he put his hand to his head like this and he rocked back and forth in his seat as Jim Gunn does when he's thinking about something. He was totally in the moment and that really impressed me. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Did you have difficulty <clears throat> gaining access to people for interviews? Absolutely none, I would say. Um, whenever there, when there was a meeting at Caltech, I would look at the, the roster beforehand and I would highlight people I wanted to talk to and then I would just hijack them and take them into my office, which was down the hallway and interview them. And then they would get back to the meeting. Um, I interviewed people, some people at Palomar, uh, some people who were out of the country like uh, Chip Arp, I interviewed on the phone. Um, so I, I'd say I, I didn't really have any trouble. Well, for, the, for that many interviews, that's really quite remarkable, I think. <laughs> that was um, one of my problems. Got a question? Where was the photo of Einstein taken? Um, oh God, where was that? Um, Westinghouse. In West, at Westinghouse, they had just finished um, putting the, the final boat, I think it was called the final boat ceremony, and they were just putting the final boat into the uh, support tube for the telescope. Westinghouse oh. in South Philadelphia, I think. Yes. Yes. Very good. Um, what year was the first infrared instrument used on the 200 inch telescope? Oh, I don't know if I can remember that exactly off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, too many things. <laughs> it's in the book. It's in the book. Yes. Early 1960s. Thank you. <laughs> Early 1960s. Okay, let me, we've got questions coming in here. Let me keep up with them. Um, Fred Zwicky, Fred Zwicky died, okay. many, Fritz Zwicky died many years ago. Were you able to interview his family or associates? I talked with his granddaughter, um, but she didn't know him. She had some of his materials, um, but no, I wasn't able to. Okay, I, I, and I, I think I think some of his relatives are still are still around. I'm not sure. Uh, another question. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I did talk with Barbarina briefly on the phone. Barbarina, yes. Yes, yes. Um, mentioned fact, doing some fact checking. Did fact checking the interviews reveal anything interesting, anything particular about the discussions you'd had with the people? Fact checking. Fact checking. I found some discrepancies occasionally uh, between what astronomers would claim and what I found to be, uh, what I found in the literature or checking with other astronomers. And I had to find some way of uh, making sense of these different uh, viewpoints. Um, and I did my best to represent what I thought really happened. Ah, uh, good point. Yes, very much so. 
Um, Alan Rice asks, the photo, one photo that showed a plastic model of the telescope, does that model or any, any similar model of the telescope still exist? I believe I saw one, uh, there might be one in the vault. Uh, the vault, yes, okay. Yeah, potentially in the vault. Uh, Bill McClellan showed me a model years ago um, that was at least similar to that model. The vault. Mm -hmm. The okay. vault. <laughs> um, and question, which observatories did you visit in Chile? Well, I observed at uh, Cerro Tololo. Most of my observing was done there. Um, I took some images at Las Campanas and then ESO, some spectra at ESO, European Southern Observatory. Ah, okay. And um, that, that's the entire list of questions I have <laughs> right now. Okay. Anybody else got anything? Um, I'm going to return the screen back to stop the screen sharing and say hello to everybody. If, 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 if there is nothing else, if anybody's got any other questions, let me again point out that Gene Zacola is in the gift shop today. We have permission to sell the book prior to the official publication date. And Gene will take orders if you call 760-742-2117. She'll be there for a couple hours. Um, uh, Steve, Steve. Yes, yes. Uh, I go back to my earlier question. Now that uh, Linda is online, can we get autographed copies? I was afraid you'd ask that again. <laughs> Pandemic copies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so much for my author tour, right? Poof. <laughs> Well, the, lo the logistics of doing autographing sound a little formidable right now. So we'll, we'll see if we can come back to that one. There's a question from Annie. Where? Annie, Annie had a question. I don't, um, it's not in the chat, I don't <laughs> hear. Well, she, she was asking, uh, how does this book differ from The Perfect Machine? The Perfect Machine was about the funding and construction of the telescope. It's an excellent book. I love it. Um, but it has very little of the science and what was done. And it's also published um, at least 20 years ago. Um, and this book, although I, I touch upon the construction and funding of the telescope, it's about the science that was done at the telescope, and this is a first for this for this uh, observatory. Yeah, different, different, whole different focus in that sense. Whole, whole different focus, yes. Whole different focus. Yeah, a lot of the work done at Palomar, in fact, has has not been attributed to Palomar. Um, so I'm happy to put the name out there again, and and uh, the names of the astronomers. There are lots of graduate students in this book who made some pretty fundamental discoveries. And so that's kind of a cool part of it also. Could you, could you repeat the phone number again? Repeat the phone number for the gift shop at the observatory. Gift shop and bookstore, 760, 76, try it again, 760, 742, two, one one seven. Great, thank you. And Jean, Jean will be there for a couple hours 
today to take orders. Um, and with that. One more comment. Uh, my, my understanding is that uh, a significant part of the uh, cover price of this book actually will go to Palomar. A lot more than I'm getting, put it that way. <laughs> well, that's tremendous. That's wonderful. That's <laughs> yeah, wonderful. yeah, yeah. So it's a contribution. <laughs> well, we want to thank Great. everybody for doing that. And with that, Thanks again, Steve, for organizing these. And thank you, uh, Dr. Schweitzer, for an interesting and informative talk. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Absolutely wonderful. And I think, I think you'll find the synthesis of material in the book, the way it brings all the stuff about the science together is, is really tremendous. It's, it, it, it's really quite remarkable. Um, with that, Two weeks from now, Dr. Amruta Giodand, excuse me, will be speaking on the subject of neutron stars, the joy of rapid dead stars. That's an intriguing title if I've ever heard one. <laughs> and thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you. Hey, have a good Thanksgiving holiday, and please have a safe Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you for being here. And with that, I'm going to end the meeting with thanks to Dr. Schweitzer and thanks to everybody. So wave, everybody wave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.